In this week's episode of the Nerd by Word, we are looking at DC's slate of books and the return to Amalgam. The Byword begins now. Welcome into episode 184 of the Nerd by Word, the only podcast certified to serve up the good stuff when it comes to the nerd world. Uh, we thank you so much for joining us this week, uh, and we are looking at this continued adventure into the second season, as it were, of Amalgam Comics. Uh, this week we're looking at DC's slate, and we're very excited to get into that and look at those books uh, a series of five one shots. But first, as always, it is time for. Nerd news. And it wouldn't be a complete nerd news segment without Dave talking about his fave. It's Superman time. And not just any kind of Superman time. No, it is time for the best era of Superman. Up, you know, totally objectively speaking. Because, and these are actual headlines going around the internet right now, like Superman's best era, um, is getting an omnibus release starting this fall. And I tell you, this is going to get expensive, but it is, oh my god, it's totally worth it because this is really the era that Superman finally ensnared me into the comic books. So Penguin Random House has announced that starting in December, DC will begin printing omnibus editions of Superman's Triangle Era, the time between uh, January 1991 and April of 2002. Now, this was called the Triangle Era because there were four monthly Superman books going on, but rather than being four individual stories, they told an overarching narrative. And so to make it easier for fans to see the connective tissue they put a little triangle on there that had the year and the number uh, of the issue in in the sequence right so you would see like you know superman the man of steel number 25 but it might have a triangle on it that says uh, 1991 18 so this is the 18th issue in the overall story in 1991 right so this is a, this is a huge deal. Uh, a lot of this stuff hasn't been reprinted since the '90s, right? Um, and so this is this is really really exciting stuff. Um, so uh, obviously this ran for years, and my understanding is based on what little information is out there about this first omnibus edition. It's going to be hardcover. Um, and it's going to be by year. So each book is essentially going to collect somewhere around 52 individual uh, comic book issues plus any annuals or anything like that what that was going on that year. Which means we are looking at, uh, you know, potentially uh, 10 or 11 omnibuses. Omnibus I? I'm not sure. Uh, but anyways, this is this is massive, right? We're looking at like, I think, a cover cost of $125 a piece. Um Ooh. Yeah, it's rich, but it's hardback, and and I have to say it, it's it's super tempting, especially if they space them out a little bit for somebody like me, who basically like lived off of the Triangle era. I came in to Superman comic books probably right before the Death and Return of Superman storyline, um, so right around 1992, I think, is is when I really got into it, and I have to say like. What, even once you get past like the death and return of Superman, this time period was a really, really good time period for Superman stories. Really consistently interesting and good with a very rich supporting cast, something that only recently, I think, in Superman comics is really being stressed again. A really rich and interesting supporting cast that all have ongoing stories. Everything feels very connected. Basically, the triangle of era of Superman is to the Superman franchise what Star Trek Deep Space Nine was to the Star Trek franchise, right? It's the place where they actually did some, some really consistent, intricate, continuity-based storytelling. And it really, really works. It's by far my favorite era in Superman comic books. So, so Chris, I'm excited to see this reprinted. Hopefully... Uh, the price is not too rich, and a lot of people are going to get, uh, you know, their first exposure to a really fantastic era of Superman comic books. 
Yeah, that's that's a hefty price tag, and uh, to say the least. But I, I'm excited to see more of these things collected, and kind of reaching back towards these these earlier eras of comics because if for no other reason then that puts them in like a digital remastering thing where we're we're getting more and more comics kind of of collected and if for no other reason like even if you were to go for like a, a digital version of this even having these collected with like a complete reading guide I think that's that's incredibly beneficial and so I'm I'm all for collecting more editions of comics and making it more accessible to fans and i will say for for people who don't want to go the uh you know are not that interested in the era maybe or or not willing to take the dive at 125 dollars for the first you know year of this uh let me just go ahead and point out that on dc universe infinite they actually have um a curated list called a triangle era uh which are i think over three different lists and go in perfect reading or order to re-experience the triangle era so if that's if that's a cheaper way to go and you want to read it that way that's an option as well but for long time fans like like myself i think seeing that collected in hardback that that's really exciting and i'd love to be able to put these on my bookshelf all righty chris so uh you are going star wars this week what have you got so we got our first trailer for The Acolyte, which has been a highly anticipated series set 100 years before the events of The Phantom Menace. So we're going far into this High Republic era that has seemingly been a point of focus in the comics and in the novelizations. Um, and it looks really intriguing to me. We've got um, a lots, lots of new characters. We've got lots of kind of seemingly expansive storytelling in the in the Star Wars universe, something that you and I have been clamoring for. Not the same old, same old. Um, it looks like we've we've got some uncharted territory. This gives me the same kind of feeling that Andor did of something new and something fresh um, in the Star Wars universe, which, you know, is, is something we've been longing for. Um, we, we've got this shadowy kind of character that we don't know exactly what's going on with, with May as a, a central figure. We've got a Jedi ass assassin, someone who's killing off Jedi. Uh, we've got, um, a new Jedi master, uh, played by Lee Jung Jae. We've got, I mean, Carrie Ann Moss being a Jedi master and Dara is, seems really cool. And then I think a lot of people's favorites was Jedi Master Kelnaka, the Wookiee Jedi, who is being played by Junus uh, Suatomo, who who previously played um, Chewbacca in, in the sequel trilogy. Vernesta Rowe, who apparently has a lightsaber that also turns into a whip. Um We've got Daphne Keene, who won a lot of hearts over as as X-23, as a new Padawan character. So there's lots to be excited about this, in my opinion. You've got uh, Jodie Turner-Smith leading a coven of witches in the Star Wars universe. Uh, and so, like, the deeper and weirder and more diverse that we can get with Star Wars, I am all here for. And this will uh, the first two episodes are going to premiere at the beginning of June, and I can't wait for this, man. I, I'm very interested in this. Um, I have to say that the uh, the online reaction uh, was not exactly what I would call uh, kind towards this trailer. I'm predictably really, really getting predictably weird by Star Wars fans. Predictably weird. Yes, I I have to say that I am getting a little. Um, I'm getting a little tired of the consistent negativity that people keep spouting when it comes to stuff like Star Wars right now. Like. You know, you, you can't have it both ways, right? Like so many fans, even like the MCU, Star Wars, Star Trek, a lot of franchises right now, they're like, I don't want more of the same. Uh, and then every time that somebody tries to do something a little different with a franchise, they're like, that, not like that. I want different, but not that. Well, the, I don't think fans really know what they want. So oftentimes it's best to just sit back and wait till you see the finished product before making a call on it. So I, I find the Acolyte trailer really interesting. I think that uh, that era is uh, an interesting place to set the story and to begin with. 
Um, I see, I've seen a lot of discourse around there's Sith in this show and therefore it breaks canon because the Jedi said that, that no Sith had been seen for a thousand years or something. Well, first of all, we don't know if they're Sith because we've not seen the show. And second of all, if we've learned anything from the prequels is that the Jedi are not big on uh, seeing is believing considering that Qui-Gon Jinn fought, fought Darth Maul and the Jedi Council was like, nah, couldn't be a Sith. We don't believe that, right? So, so I think there's plenty of reasons not to feel like this necessarily breaks canon. The most interesting thing to me, and I think this was the Carrie Ann Moss character, Character, and I actually posted about this on social media as well, is that there is a fight scene kind of hinted at in the trailer where uh, this this Jedi is fighting without a lightsaber. Mm-hmm. And I have been di- I've been dying for something like that. I talked about, about that with uh, with Ahsoka and when they find Ezra Bridger and he you know, says he doesn't need a lightsaber there at the beginning. And then, of course, he makes another lightsaber. And I'm like, that's what I always wanted Yoda to be in Attack of the Clones. You know, like I didn't want him to whip out a little lightsaber and start flipping around. I always thought if you reach a certain power level as a Jedi, you would fight even without a weapon completely, like just using the force. And what I've seen in the trailer of that scene, I'm really hoping that that's what we're getting because it looks really cool. And and, and I think that opens up um, some interesting possibilities in like fight choreography and stuff. Once you say, okay, we have this Jedi who's powerful enough that they don't need a lightsaber, what are they going to do with the Force to fight? You know, and I'm I'm fascinated by something like that. That would be something visually very different for a change, and something I've been waiting for since Attack of the Clones. So I'm cautiously optimistic right now. Um, I'm really looking forward to checking it out, and I hope it, I hope it lives up to its promise. Yeah, I, I'm seeing what I what I got from that trailer was like a real cool kind of induction of like martial arts in this. And so like I, I was getting a little bit of like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon kind of vibes with some of those fight fight scenes that we saw in the trailer. And so I'm, I'm very excited about it. Yeah. And I think, you know, where where better to have something like that, an infusion of martial arts than something like Star Wars, which mm-hmm. is so obviously inspired by, by you know, Japanese history in so many Absolutely. different ways, right? So, you know, so many visual cues, so much about, you know, the Force philosophy, all is so closely linked with Japanese culture. I mean, the original Star Wars movie is essentially a, a, a sci-fi remake of The Hidden Fortress, right? So let's, let's not even, um, if any franchise could handle some some martial arts in it i think uh star wars would definitely be the place absolutely all right that wraps up nerd news for this week uh when we return from this our first break we are going to come at you with the dc's return to amalgam comics stick around Welcome back to the main segment of our show. We call it our byword. And this week we have the five one-shot issues that were released during this second season of Amalgam Comics, Return to the Amalgam Age of Comics, the DC Collection. Um... And so we're going to go through those and give kind of our reactions to reading them. Um, I'll toss them up to Dave. And then uh, just a look ahead at where we're going next episode, he'll do the same for me uh, next week with Marvel's uh, slate of releases. First up on the docket, we have Bat Thing number one, written by Larry Hama. Uh, uh, art by Rodolfo DiMaggio. We have Inks by Bill Sienkiewicz himself. Um, and colors by Gloria Vasquez. Dave, what was your uh, thoughts on reading Bat Thing? So very clearly, uh, this is one of those where you can very, very quickly see what the amalgamation is. We're talking about Man Bat and Man Thing, right? Um, And visually, that's very clear when you look at the cover. I have to say, I kind of like this issue. I thought there was a there's a a through line in here of that I've always really liked, and that is, you know, when you have a character that becomes monstrous that turns themselves into something inhuman, but there's still enough humanity in there that they're trying to do something good, you know. And the mystery of the issue of whether, um, you know, wh- whether Bat Thing is just a monster or if there's enough in him still that, it, that you know there's there's some humanity left. I think that was a really interesting through line through the story. Um, I like the art generally too. I think it was pretty reminiscent of that era of of Batman comic books, which is appropriate considering you know one of the amalgamations is is Man Bat, and uh, there is very clearly um, 
you know, it's set in Gotham City and, and a lot of it, Montoya is here and we got a, an amalgamation featuring Harvey Bullock too. So I think, uh, you know, the art works on that level. It very much feels like a Gotham City set DC book. The, the one thing that kind of irked me is some of the dialogue. Um, mm-hmm. And you and I text, texted back and forth about that a little bit. Like, I, they were kind of going over the top in this issue a little bit, trying to capture some kind of weird lingo that just didn't quite work for me. It didn't come across as authentic. It really came on as like, you know, putting on airs a little bit. Like, like I don't know, man. Like, when, when you know, they talk about like uh, Bullock shooting somebody in the face, he says, had to, he went for his biscuit, babe. And I'm like, his biscuit? <laughs> what do you mean his what do you mean his biscuit? And then they, they hit you with all this this alliteration, like Fat Freddy Finelli, you know? That's, it becomes like this huge tongue twister just to read the first page. <laughs> it was just really bizarre dialogue in a couple of places. But, you know, that that vibe of that Gotham City and the way it looked like in the, in the 90s and in the early 2000s, that era of Batman comic books I'm pretty fond of anyways. And it kind of captures that vibe in a lot of ways, I think. It's like maybe two degrees removed from something Gotham centrally, maybe a little bit, which is one of my all-time favorite books anyways. So I thought there was something really cool about this one. Uh, Missed the mark a little bit in some of the dialogue, but overall, I like this one. It's funny. um, Story time. So my senior year AP English class, we had read Macbeth. And our class project, like our big final, was to shoot a film that was basically putting that through a filter. So we had to choose kind of like a genre of film that we wanted to to remake Macbeth under. And we went film noir. And so we were going for that 20s, 30s era film noir and stuff like that. And so... You know, as 17, 18 year old kids, we were looking up on the internet what 20s and 30s lingo was. And it was very much in that same vein. We were saying things like, my daddy, me daddy's the cat's pajamas, and oh, she's a real tomato, and stuff like that. And so it was, it very felt like the same kind of ilk of like trying to play with this outdated dialogue and 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 putting on airs a little bit too much so i'm, I'm right there with you on the dialogue um but overall i got the same kind of vibe like um, i got some kurt connor's the lizard vibes from this i'm not as well versed in man bat or man thing so that that's the airs that i got here of uh, was like kurt connor's the lizard um, but I, I, I thought it was really kind of cool twist at the end. Um, uh, and it was a real fun story where he's actually looking out for Bullock. Um, he, he, and it was really kind of cool twist, even though Bullock was a character that I don't know if you're rooting for or not. Um, but, uh, it's, it's really interesting kind of twist there at the end. And I think, it, uh, you know, like the best Amalgam books, it lays a foundation where you almost want to read more. It feels mm-hmm. like it's part of a larger tale, right? And so I could see this story continuing as they further explore how much humanity is there. If, is he able to communicate? Can he be cured? Like, there's a lot of interesting things going on with this particular one. Um, yeah, I, I, I like this one a lot. Uh, not perfect by any means, but but solid, I think. All right, that brings us to... The, probably the most peak 90s amalgam thing, man. We have Dark Claw Adventures, number one, uh, by Ty Templeton, Rick Burchette, and Linda Medley. And this is essentially Dave Batman, the animated series, with a little bit of X-Men in, 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 inducted in there. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's this one was interesting to me as a huge Batman the animated series fan. Um, you know, we we talked in the first season about like the Dark Claw issue and how I felt like Dark Claw was a little overdesigned and although it was a fun action issue, I didn't think it really did a lot with the character. And here comes Dark Claw Adventures, and I have to say right away I like this one like 100% better. Like I I thought this one worked on a really really interesting level. I think uh they did some very smart things here first. Uh, and foremost, the f- smartest thing they did is bringing in Rick Burchett, because Burchett was actually involved with the Batman the Animated Series tie-in comic books as one of the artists. 
So you're, you're immediately bringing somebody in who can capture that exact look and vibe perfectly. And so when you're looking at the art, it feels straight up like like something that could have come from Batman the Animated Series. It's a, it's a thing of beauty, really. Um, I really like what they did with the Dark Claw design here, where it was, you know, really over-designed, trying to bring it down to the look of... Um, Batman the Animated Series meant having to streamline it, and I think it, it looks 100% better here. Much simpler, much cleaner lines, not way over-designed. I really like the, the suit here, probably the best of all the amalgam art I've seen of him. It's probably the best he's looked. I really like the influence in the face of like Batman the Animated Series Bruce Wayne too. It's very much got that Logan hair, you know, from, from the but but the face really feels Bruce Wayneish in most shots, you know, just maybe little bushier eyebrows, but very Bruce Wayneish. I thought it was a very nice um, you know, middle line. So design-wise, I think this was perfect and and trying to do what a what if Dark Claw had an animated series kind of comic was such a, a, a meta stroke of genius. I thought that was so awesome. I like that they brought in uh, you know Talia as a character in this one, since that is a character that is very well known for her relationship with Batman, particularly in the animated series, and that sort of back and forth. Uh, shout out to Raish Alpocalypse. What a weird name uh, to, to, to merge two characters together. I feel like that was not one of their better moves. But otherwise, I thought this book was a, a real nice little story of like Talia fa- trying to face, you know, her, her urge for revenge against somebody that she used to love. And, and you know, how, how do you come back from something like that? I, th- I thought there was really something there. A very interesting issue, very reminiscent of the animated series, obviously intentional. Um, I really liked this one. I, I thought it worked on, on a, a, probably of all the books, this one worked the best for me. But maybe that's just my love for Batman, the animated series. No, I think this was far and away the most enjoyable read. Um, this was almost, if you put X-Men, the animated series, and Batman, the animated series in a blender, and like this, this would be the end result. Like It's very much... A mash, and it's not like um, we talked about that all access series where there was a lot of boring choices with some of those amalgam characters. I think this was a much better cohesive amalgamation of those characters, and it was it was it worked well and it was fluid. The character blending made sense. Bruce Wayne and Logan, this loner who's not a loner and has relationships with young proteges. Um, I thought Sparrow, which was like a Robin Jubilee mashup, was really fun, especially considering the adventure we just went on with Jubilee and Robin uh, in our last episode. So that was fun. Uh, She had Jubilee's like spitfire attitude um, that was shining through. Uh, uh, Raz Apocalypse made me guffaw. Uh, in <laughs> like openly guffaw. So yeah, that one did not work for me. Um, it's just that so, name is so ridiculous. <laughs> it's so bad. It's so bad. Like it, like so, and it's. I think for me, like some of the amalgam stuff that doesn't work is just the the dad jokes puns that they go for with some of this and. This might be one of the most egregious, but I'm willing to overlook it because everything else is just so strong. Um, Lady Talia is a great character, a great amalgamation of Talia al Ghul and Lady Deathstrike. Um, and so, like, it's just really fun. And the ending is great because it's just Sparrow saying, okay, glad you guys made up. Can you untie me now? Like, it, it's just really, <laughs> it's just really fun, and I really enjoyed this. And this is one of those where, like, God, I wish this was a real thing because I want to read more. Less Raz Apocalypse, but every time I say it, I feel like I'm kicking myself in the shin. But, um, but <laughs> everything else, like, I'm absolutely here for. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree wholeheartedly. But, yeah, you're right. It, this This was probably the most enjoyable out of this batch. Now we're going to go for a real mix. Um, this was this was an interesting one, Dave. I don't know about you, but we're looking at JLX Unleashed by Priest, possibly Christopher Priest, I'm pretty sure, uh, Oscar Jimenez, 
uh, Hannibal Rodriguez and Patricia Mulvihill. What was your read on this one, Dave? So I, I tried to kind of put it in context a little bit with uh, the previous JLX issue. This is technically a sequel to, you know, a previous one and not, you know, a thematic shift like they did with Dark Claw, um, but really like a, a proper sequel. And the, the vibe you get is that, you know, there was a big crossover event and some, some apocalyptic stuff happened and some characters died or were banished or got depowered. And this is supposed to be a, re a relaunch of JLX, basically. And so trying to keep that in mind... Um, I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, you know, not all the amalgamations in this one necessarily really worked for me. Um, we Hey, shout out to my boy Super Soldier for a nice guest spot there at, at, at the beginning. I really like that. Um, but yeah, I, I thought there were interesting things happening here. Obviously, I'm not as well versed in like the, the X-Men side of things, but the way they handled some of the, the, the amalgamations and JLA characters, how they tried to do things with the characters they introduced previously in a, in a more interesting way. You know, the, the Martian Manhunter, Professor X amalgamation, for example, ends up being a scroll, which I thought was really interesting. That's not something that they mentioned the first time around. That was that was a really interesting move. And obviously he got injured since the last time we saw him and is now in, in, in a wheelchair reminiscent of Professor X. Um, the, what, what they did with the, the amalgam... I think they call him Apollo, the amalgamation of Cyclops and the Ray. Um, was interesting about how he's going through like an, another stage of mutation by the end of the issue. And just basically this is like team building, like they're rebuilding a team from the ashes of the previous team. The most interesting thing in here, I think, was what they did with Amazon, the amalgamation of Storm and Wonder Woman, by basically revealing that she is in fact a mutant as well, uh, which is not something that they did really in the first season. Um, my biggest problem with that is that it ends up uh, being hinted at throughout the issue, and then at the end it's just a throwaway line, I'm coming with you, I'm one of you, but you know, it's never like played as this huge reveal, like they're playing it up. I thought that was a missed opportunity in the story. Um, but yeah, I think overall it, it was it was pretty good. Um, again, keeping in mind that for uh, a lot of these characters, I'm not as familiar with the X side of things. I think the... A uh, creeper nightcrawler amalgamation is probably the most fun in this, uh, just for the constant sarcastic comments. There's a lot of um, powers, I think, from nightcrawler and a lot of personality from the creeper there. Um, but it worked for me. I think overall this was a fine issue. It was not, you know, at the heights of of something like Dark Claw. Um, and it was interesting enough that I would read more in this story. But on the flip side, uh, it it did not, you know. Uh, I, let, let me just put it this way. It's not actively offensive as another issue in the series was. <laughs> um, so it's fine. Not not the heights of Dark Claw, but fine. I enjoyed certain elements of this one. Um, some of the amalgamations are a little lazy. Uh, like Rogue is just Rogue. I don't even know what her name is. Um, Iceberg is an amalgamation. <laughs> like, sorry, Iceberg. I'm just thinking of lettuce the whole time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I didn't know who the I didn't know the creeper existed, and so I thought this was just a pervy Nightcrawler and Beast Boy mix up. So that's that's news to me. So I was less of a fan because I was just like, you're you're making my boy a perv here, and I wasn't a fan of that. Um, the probably the most egregious thing is the the lightning of. Amazon skin, never a fan of that. It's pretty bad. They never get that right. They didn't get that right in the first season either. It's really annoying how they keep bouncing back and forth on that. Yeah, uh, but I think the most intriguing thing was the Martian Manhunter Charles Xavier amalgamation. The introduction of the idea that he's a scroll is fascinating to me. Um, they didn't really do a whole lot with that. And, and again, this is one of those things when it's a one shot. What are you gonna do? Um, yeah. Um, I thought Fin Fang Flame was a fun adversary for them to go up against. I think that was like on the level of an X-Men big bad or a Justice League big bad, like um, similar to what they did with, with, with Starro in James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. So that was a fun thing. And they finally take care of him at the end. I thought it was... It was uh, a really good build up to that final fight you think he's beaten but then he's not but then he is and then you have this dark broody character of apollo kind of doing their thing so that was that was interesting um so i had a kind of a, a mixed bag of feelings on this one um 
but it, it was overall I enjoyed it. I think my favorite moment was probably when when Fing Fang Flame says this isn't over, and then he kind of like explodes and he's like, uh, then again, <laughs> it's, <just> like, <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a fun little moment, you know? Like, yeah, I, I think there I think there were definitely some good things about it, but like I said, not not nearly to the level of something like Dark Claw. All right, Dave. Um, that brings us to a comic that exists. Lobo the Duck. Lobo the Duck number one by Al Grant, Val Semix, Ray Crissing, and Francesco Ponzi. I don't even know how to talk about this one, man. I'm going to be completely honest with you. Um, I can tell you that I actively disliked it. Um, but there's probably a reason for that. Uh, well, the very first thing to keep in mind is that I do not like Lobo. I know that as a DC fan, that might be uh, borderline, you know, sacrilegious. But Lobo, to me, um, was supposed to be a parody of a certain type of character. And instead, a whole bunch of people started taking him way too seriously. Um, so for me, Lobo has always worked the best when he's, like, for example, used as a Superman villain. Um, I think uh, Superman the Animated Series did that really well. Um, th- there, it kind of works. But for the most part, like as a as a main character or somebody's stories who I want to read, I never really enjoyed Lobo stories. I never bought into that particular hype train. And so the, the flip side is that I also don't know too much about Howard the Duck. I've I've read a little bit. I saw the you know, the movie uh back in the day, <laughs> which is atrocious in its own right. Um so my my Howard the Duck knowledge is extremely limited, and my my Lobo knowledge is not limited. I just actively don't like Lobo, and so slamming those two things together, I think they thought it would be funny to have a duck character that is that violent and over the top, and frankly, it just didn't work for me. Like in in no way, shape, or form did this comic work for me. I just did not enjoy it i i put it down three times and picked it back up i i had to force myself to keep reading um you know assassins from this first season uh, of amalgam was probably our least favorite issue right but i would say that i would rather read the further adventures of cat's eye than another issue of lobo the duck this was this was the pits uh, it just did not work for me in any way shape or form chris it's really an uncomfortable read in an era where we are, at least you'd like to think, we're trying to be better about treatment of female characters and being more socially aware, this is incredibly difficult to read. It's it's pretty gross. Um, you have Lobo the Duck being this womanizer and treats all the female characters that he comes into contact with like a used rag it's pretty gross and it was a very uncomfortable read for me um this is just not my cup of tea to begin with those um gotta check your testosterone levels type of characters like just don't really do anything for me um and so this was just i, I mean obviously this was not something catered to me and my personal likings but it was it was really aggressively bad in my opinion um this feels like something that was going for irony chris but yeah. uh, it it legit it legitimately felt like something that ethan van skyver would have written unironically you know what i mean like it's it's that sort of level of storytelling really really uncomfortable there's one moment i liked one was moment. it the was it the breaking the fourth wall with the 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 forgettable guard or whatever no my favorite moment is when he threatens his mirror image to try to t- try to remember something and his mirror image oh, says yeah. i give up i'll talk i'll talk that was the one moment i thought was kind of funny like everything else just didn't land with me that one was fine and then the breaking of the fourth wall by like the forgettable grunt worker that one was kind of okay but other than that like this was the the quicker we can move on to the next book the better yeah let's do that i'm, I'm okay with that all right, and then we go to our final book, one that was probably made just for you, Super Soldier Man of War number 1 by Dave Gibbons, Mark Wade, Jimmy Palmiotti, and Angus McKee. 
can we just say what an all-star group of people this is having dave gibbons mark wade and jimmy palmiati all working on a book together <laughs> that's that that's just awesome um yeah uh, as you probably have already guessed i absolutely love this one um you know when we did the the first uh, super soldier uh, issue uh, one of the things you mentioned is that it's very light on captain america it very much feels like a superman book he works at the newspaper you know um and he's doing the thing with the glasses to disguise himself and all that well here they kind of go back in time and they tell us a story of super soldier during world war Two, and it's very much top to bottom a tribute to that era's um captain america comic book so it's it's a little less superman in the storytelling and a little more captain america this time around but but man it works i really really liked it uh interesting to see uh peggy as a french character i didn't see that twist coming <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think the whole issue just kind of sung. If you're if you're into that sort of World War II era um, Captain America storytelling, then this is going to be totally up your alley. It absolutely works. The art looks great. The storytelling is snappy. Um, it's a really really fun story. And and we get a little bit of pre Green Skull Lex Luthor before he shoots himself up with too much kryptonite and turns himself green. Um, I just I really like this. I, I this it was just this this was basically developed in a lab specifically for me like it's just that that's what it is it just it just worked for me from top to bottom i think off the top my only gripe is the cartoonishly bad like accents and the way that they write the french character of peggy and the german characters i'm sorry how did you t- how did you take that one how did they they wrote the german dialogue not great, but yeah. uh, in fairness, I th- I think that might be. I- I'm I'm not so quick to say that this was something that they did, to, you know, because they were careless. I almost feel like this was d- done purposefully because, again, it's a tribute to a bygone era of comics, and that's very much what you what you would have seen back then, right? So I think they were kind of going for a little of authenticity for the era, maybe a little bit. Um, and in that sense, I think it worked. So I did I didn't if if this would have been like a modern time. Uh, set sort of uh, Captain America inspired story, then I, I, I would have found that really, really bothersome. But given what they're trying to go for with this, I, I think I can forgive that. Yeah, I think uh, overall I enjoyed it. And like, again, that was like the only thing that was like, oh, okay, kind of roll your eyes and you continue reading. Um, but again, like you said, it's it's very much in the same vein of the golden age of, of comics. Um, but I felt like this was really, really fun and it felt like an old Indiana Jones flick, you know, like if, if we in- yeah. introduce super heroics into it, it was very much in line with this felt like an Indiana Jones film. Um, it, it's really a great, similar to dark claw. It was a great actual amalgamation, like a blending of the two. It wasn't too much of one, too much of the other. It was, it was very much kind of blended and maybe it's the creative team. You have, um, you know, I, I'm not sure of the timeline here, but I know that Mark Wade has written for both brands, and so he kind of has a great grasp of of both of these characters. Um, Absolutely, and, and it, it was incredibly enjoyable. Um, even even with that nitpick uh, aside, this felt very kind of like a lived in universe. This was one of those where you have the revelation there at the end with Luther. Um, and I'm dying to know more. I want the next issue of this. I want an entire series of this. Peggy is fun and great and exciting. Um, I want a little mini with her. Like, what what is her, like, her spy stories and stuff like that. Um, Jimmy's an enjoyable dork. Um, and uh, I, I really, really enjoyed this one. I think it also was interesting what they did with, did with Lois Lane, even though we only sort of had a... You know, glimpse her. We glimpse, need definitely more of for that. For a second, and she was gone. We need more. But of man, that. that the Lois Lane that ended up marrying Lex Luthor. You know, like that would have been a really interesting thing to dive into too. There's so many hints of interesting. There's so many hints of interesting stories in this one that I would love to know more about, man. All right, that's the final book of this series. Next week, we will come back with the Marvel collection and see how those shake out. When we come back from this, our final break, we're looking at. Nerd Commendations. (music) 
Now we're back for the fan favorite segment where we recommend the good stuff to you and share it out. Uh, we call it. Dave, what do you have for us this week? You're going, man, this is a complete episode for you. Yeah, I'm getting I'm getting all my Superman goodness in this week, and I'm very, very excited about that. I've had some issues in recent weeks finding time to really sit down and read new comics, but I made a point to go back and, uh, and kind of get caught up on one series I've had my eye on for a while. A while back, I recommended uh, a comic book miniseries called Superman 78, which is uh, taking place in the world of the uh, Richard Donner Superman movies, and uh, basically was a continuation of those movies. And I have to say, uh, I really liked that miniseries. Uh, I thought it was a great story, uh, a sort of what if they would have done um, a Brainiac story in that particular movie franchise. And on that level, I thought it worked fantastically. There is still something really special to me, even after all these years of the, uh, uh, there's something special about the Donner verse, if you want to call it that, right? Of like that version of Superman and Lois and Jimmy and Perry. It's it's sort of classic and timeless and works in its very own sort of way, even though it is of a very particular moment in time. And so imagine my absolute delight when they put the team back together uh, and they put out another miniseries, uh, Superman 78, The Metal Curtain. And here, I think, we start seeing the real genius of this series you know, come into full focus. Because Robert Venditti, who is doing the writing on this book, has uh, the ability to perfectly emulate and encapsulate the characterizations of these characters from the Donner Superman movies, while at the same time introducing ideas and concepts from the comic books in a way that feels perfectly natural and appropriate to that world. And I pulled it off with Brainiac and I thought that worked really well. Well, here he comes out swinging and does it again. And we get... Uh, this world's version of Metallo, here a uh, member of the uh, Soviet army and part of the Soviet Union's effort to take down the United States. We get uh, this franchise's version of Lois Lane's dad, the General Lane, uh, and we even get a very, very strong hint of this world's version of Hal Jordan um, as the pilot who is goes unnamed is running around in this story, uh, whose call sign is Highball, which is, you know, which is Hal Jordan in the comic books um so I, I think on that level it's fantastic like the idea of taking uh the world of of the donner superman movies but also introducing more ideas and characters from the comic books but in a way that feels completely natural and appropriate to that particular continuity oh chef's kiss it just works perfectly it also has a great 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 characterization for superman here um there's interesting things going on as he's once again struggling with uh how much he wants to tell lois who he really is uh we have the fact that he has the the uh, um, you know the shrunken city of candor uh, the bottle city he has it now in his fortress of solitude from the previous miniseries and his parents are alive in that city right so you know he wants to unshrink this thing so he can reunite with his family that's obviously a thing we get a meet the parents kind of vibe right where he is meeting general lane for the first time and lois uh, gets to talk to superman's kryptonian parents for the first time there's all sorts of interesting character stuff happening here layered on top of this really really perfect blending of the movie world and the comic book world so if you're in for some really just classic superman storytelling that that just works on on every single conceivable level this is that book uh superman 78 the metal curtain is fantastic chris yeah this looks fascinating because i've i've seen some um like screen to page adaptations that don't work very well they look too photorealistic uh photoshoppy uh, but the art alone on this is very intriguing to me because it looks like the characters from the film franchise but it, it looks like lived in and it looks great so this is very very intriguing to me 
and the facial expressions in the art. I cannot, I cannot speak highly enough of the facial expressions. It does exactly what good comic book art is supposed to do. Rather than having to have a whole bunch of dialogue explaining the characters' feelings, so much of their feelings is, are, are written on their face. Uh, the, the facial artwork in particular in this book is top-notch, top-tier stuff. It, it's probably one of the most fun things about uh, you know, writing comic books is having an artist who can really tap into that and communicate so much of what you usually would use words for just through the art. And, and here that particular element works splendidly. It's absolutely great, man. Absolutely great. All right, Chris, uh, let's go X-Men. Um, I have not checked this out yet, but I am very, very curious about your take. So I almost made this my news story, but uh, these the the showrunner Bo DeMeo was fired ahead like a week before release and so that kind of gave me some trepidation on how this was going to work out and the X-Men fandom has been very divided about this um there are people who are like we're we're relying too much too heavily on nostalgia um and all that and they should be making a new show we should not be retreading uh, but i mean at the same time and, and and I've been, you know, a large proponent of that. I, I think nostalgia can be overused and the bait. But at the same time, I feel like this animated series was so formative for so many people that I think revisiting it um, can be an opportunity to kind of kind of recenter why the X-Men are so important, why they appeal to so many people. Um, and even kind of casual nerd culture consumers have been kind of brought back in with this. You've got LeBron James talking about the X-Men uh, on, on Twitter. So that was a in pretty incredible moment. And uh, so I, I dove head over heels in and I watched it with my youngest two children. Uh, they were in love with it. I had to rewatch the second, uh, second episode with them because I cheated and watched it alone. And so they wanted to watch the second episode um, and it's incredibly strong. Uh, there, there have been lots of critiques about the animation, but I, I don't get that at all. Like it looks like any other animated product. Um, it's still hand drawn animation, according to some reports I've seen, which is incredibly cool. They're not relying on CGI and and all of that stuff, and so it looks very much in line with the '90s. Um, and the character moments are great. Um, as a Magneto and Cyclops fan and Storm fan, they all have standout moments that um, just really make the emotions swell as a fan. Um, there's a spoiler at the end of the second episode that had my seven-year-old daughter in tears, and I had to spoil the comic stories because she was so emotional and inconsolable about what happened. But they're invested. They have their favorite characters. And this is kind of similar to how I felt with the release of the Kawabunga collection and all those old Ninja Turtle games. And being able to share this generational thing with my kids is, is something that's really powerful and really, really cool. Um, so I, I, I really enjoyed these first two episodes and an incredible cliffhanger for the the end of the second that... We we just have to have um, episode three. Uh, KJ, uh, my my son was viscerally upset and and said that the X one were mean because season or episode three is not available right now. So um, X Men ninety seven is as advertised. It's great. Um, I think this is going to be a really important kind of recentering as we head into the future of the MCU at large. And if maybe this can be kind of a touchstone for Marvel animation and kind of a, a great sign of things to come. It's interesting that you say that, you know, touchstone for Marvel animation. Uh, I've always been more of a DC guy. This is well known on the pod. And uh, in that era of animated series, I tended more towards, you know, Batman, Superman, um, and eventually, you know, the Justice League series. Um, but I did watch the Spider-Man animated series and the X-Men animated series and, and liked both a great deal. Probably followed the Spider-Man one a little more carefully than the X-Men one. But I have very fond memories of this cartoon. The, the, the sense I'm kind of getting, though, even to this day, is that on the animation side, that DC has just a much better reputation 
for for putting out quality animated stuff whereas the marvel stuff has kind of been all over the place something like uh, spectacular spider-man for example you know didn't last very long but was very very well received and then um, I've never checked it out myself, but the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon was apparently not quite as well liked. Um, and I don't think they ever really managed to put out a um, an Avengers cartoon that really just hit. I mean, Earth's Mightiest Heroes has a really good reputation, but also didn't last very long. Um, so I, I think that is one area where, where Marvel has to maybe still some ground to make up, you know? Yeah. And so hearkening back to probably what may be its most popular animated series as a way of opening that door and letting people know that they do create um, quality animated shows might be the right move if they are willing to capitalize on it, you know? If they have something else cooking that is truly new and original or a different kind of adaptation, and then they can say, hey, you guys like, you know, the resurgence of X-Men, the animated series, now check this out. It's of similar quality. Then it could really open doors. I'm afraid that this is going to be mostly sort of a nostalgia bait kind of thing, and they don't really have any plans to capitalize on it, because that seems to be kind of what Marvel is doing lately, not capitalizing on the good things that they're putting out and, and putting out too many things that are, you know, mediocre at best, I guess. But I'm really excited to check this out. Um, I don't remember as much about the X-Men 97 continuity, obviously. I probably need to go online and refresh myself a little bit. Uh, I, I read that Morph is in this series. I thought Morph was dead. Didn't Morph die? Um, and Morph is, Morph is another scene stealer. I think Morph might be your favorite character coming out of this. Morph was incredible. I'm looking forward to seeing Morph again anyway. So I'm, I'm looking forward just to the whole shebang. So it's on my list. I'll probably be checking it out sometime this coming week. Um, and maybe we can uh, get back together in our next episode and talk about it a little bit. And, you know, I'm sure we have a, always a reason to go off topic a little bit on something like this. But I'm, I'm very curious to check it out, Chris. All right, that wraps up another episode of The Nerd By Word. We thank you so much for riding along with us and listening. If you would be so kind as to like and review and follow on your favorite podcasting platform of choice. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and nerdbyword.com. And find us on social media because we always want to know what you think of our episodes and what you thought of these amalgam books. Did we miss the train on Lobo the Duck? Did we just not get it? Is it actually secretly genius? You can go on social media and let us know at Nerd by Word or individually at that Nerd Dave and at that Nerd Chris. And as always, stay well and stay nerdy. The Nerd by Word is written and produced by Chris and Dave, two nerds with a love of all things pop culture. The podcast features music by Al Jimenez with additional drops composed by Joe Biondi. Our show art is by Ashery Design. Find us at nerdbyword.com and wherever podcasts are available. Mm-hmm.